Today we are talking about how and why to keep your gut microbiome healthy. Uh, this event is hosted by Paloma Health. We are an online medical practice focused exclusively on testing and treating hypothyroidism. And today we're joined by the team at Keen Health who are focused on microbiome research and testing. We have Dr. Harold Nunez and Take Ogawa from the Keen team with us. And we're also joined by Mary Showman, who is a thyroid patient advocate, a hormonal health coach, and an advisor to Paloma Health. And she's going to help us facilitate the conversation today. Our event is about an hour long, and we'll have some time at the end for live Q&A. So go ahead and drop your questions into the chat at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many of them as possible. Um, and without further ado, Mary, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself, introduce our speakers, and then dive into the conversation. I'm really excited to be here today and to be talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart and is an important one for anyone with thyroid condition, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, autoimmune disease, and frankly, the entire realm of autoimmune diseases and a topic that is of interest to anyone who wants to feel better and help and live a healthier life. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the microbiome, our gut health. And with us today, we have two of our uh, amazing experts from Keen Health. We have Dr. Harold Nunez. He is the microbiome lead for Keen Health. And he's a medical technologist with a PhD in biomedical science from the University of Chile. He has more than 10 years of experience in both academia and the private sector and leads Keen Health's NGS, NGS lab scientific content and their bioinformatic team. His main focus is to improve, develop, and release products that help people gain a better understanding of their microbiome by using NGS technology. Also with us today from Keen Health is Take Ogawa, who is the Chief Commercial Officer for Keen. He is the consumer, uh, Keen Health is the consumer microbiome solutions brand of Somogen Inc. Uh, Take is a business leader with more than 20 years of experience in the life sciences industry, with a particular focus on the microbiome science and genomic technologies. He most recently held leadership positions at companies such as iGenomics, Second Genome, Bina or Bina Technologies, I may not be pronouncing that correctly, and Complete Genomics. And uh, we're going to have each one of them give us a little bit more of an overview of what they're doing. And they're going to explain for those of you who may not be familiar with some of this technology, what the microbiome really is and what it means. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with Dr. Nunez. Um, and so Dr. Nunez, if you could just share a little bit more about what you do, um, your interest area, your focus on gut health, and you know, give, give us a little bit of an overview of what you are up to over there at Keen Health. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, nice to meet you all and thank you for joining us. Well, basically you, pretty much say everything in my introduction. So uh, what I can add is that I've been working on this area for a long time. Uh, I've been interested in microorganisms since uh, I was very young. Uh, I'm 40 years old now. So almost 20 years of my life have been dedicated to study science and, and later on specifically on microbes and bacteria, which I really like. Um, I'm from Chile, if that's anyone's interest, is a small but a long country down in South America. And there I study specific microbes to a very specific area of interest, which are extremophiles, which are bacteria that can thrive and live in very harsh environments. And later on, a couple of years later, I move into the human microbiome which is really interesting for me. And I really like bacteria because despite all the bad publicity that they have, uh, everyone is familiar with uh, COVID or I don't know, the flu, all are microorganisms and also uh, can give you, I don't know, diseases, harm, but bacteria and uh, other microorganisms also can be very beneficial to us. Most of the bacteria that are around us and in the world uh, are really beneficial. And for example, they produce oxygen that we breathe. They give nitrogen to the plants so they can grow. And they also 
a source of antibiotics. Many antibiotics that we use to combat other bad bacteria are coming from uh, microorganisms. They also can help us to in the dairy industry by producing yogurt, bread, and uh, beer. So despite all the bad publicity that they have, they are really important for us. We live in a very tight relationship. So that sparked my interest in bacteria. I wanted to know more about them and specifically about gut kill because I wanted to know more about the relationship between us and bacteria and how we can try to improve and learn more about them. I'm just curious about them. Um, so yeah, um, that's why I've been dedicating my uh, studies and work to try to understand the relationship with them. Great. Uh, well, obviously, um, the uh, microorganisms and the microbiome has a cheerleader and PR agent in Dr. <laughs> Nunez. And now we're going to go ahead over to Take Ogawa uh, for his introduction to tell us a little bit more about what his focus is and where, uh, where he is uh, hoping to share information with us today. Sure. Th thanks for the kind introduction there, Mary. Yeah, so Take Ogawa here, uh, Chief Commercial Officer at Keen Health. So my background and my interest in this space, again, spans over you know, the last two decades. And, and my path to this, uh, where we are today, uh, slightly different than, than Harold's in that I come more from the, the technology side, uh, the laboratory technology side that is specifically around genomics, uh, which of course is a study of the DNA and genes that make up a, any particular organism. Um, and then also the, of course, the, the again, the, the, the idea of DNA sequencing. So to be able to take uh, DNA from a cell and understand the, the, you know, the, the code of life as it were, and, and what we can decipher about what that means in terms of the function of, of biology and cause of disease and so on. And coincidentally, just about 20 years ago is when we first started thinking about the, the human genome. So there was a global effort back then to uh, many different you know, highly funded research institutions were sequencing human DNA to try to put together the first draft of the entire human genome. And that took a lot of money uh, and, and many years to do. Uh, and that was just 20 years ago. And fast forward to now, the technology has evolved to a point where we could be sequencing thousands of genomes per day from uh, one lab or e even one machine um, at just a few thousand dollars. So basically anybody can do this it is, it is, you know, I'm overgeneralizing, but in, in many ways it's become highly ubiquitous, somewhat commoditized, but that's what we need. You know, if we, if we, have, if we have to think about access to this kind of technology, just to understand our own DNA, um, again, as it relates to health or disease, uh, that's, you know, think about all the humans that live on this planet. Uh, that's what we need. But of course, what's been sort of widely, I don't want to say ignored, but kind of has been uh, prioritized sort of underneath that is what about everything else that lives on this planet as it relates to our health and, 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 and well-being and disease. And, and of course, the, the microbes that live in our environment, which we cannot see, as, as we know, um, are just as important to that. And, and so technology has, the technology and the applications of these genomics and DNA uh, based, uh, DNA sequencing based technologies have evolved to the point where now it's really about, you know, the applications of these technologies as a diagnostic, as a research tool, however you think about it. It's not just about the human cells and the human DNA, but it's everything else that's on us and within us that are non-human based, but just as important to life. And we could even think about food sources, you know, Harold alluded to plants. Well, don't we need to know the genomics of plants to understand how to grow them, how to keep them to be nutritional and so on and so forth. And we can think about animals the same way too. But as it pertains to gut health, my interest in that started, I would say just about 10 years ago from numerous factors. One is something we'll touch more on is, is as, the, as the human gut health relates to Again, all the microorganisms that live there, uh, which we've known for a long time. Obviously, you think about probiotics in that industry, nutritional supplements have been around for a long time. Um, but beyond that, thinking about diseases that affect the gut, 
um, on a more of a personal note, uh, for example, my, uh, my daughter uh, has celiac disease. Um, and I also have uh, friends and family that suffer from uh, IBD, uh, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, these are all diseases or conditions, uh, autoimmune in nature uh, of the gut. And so as we think about how these diseases become more increasingly pre prevalent and more and more people know about them, we need to, we're obviously spending a lot of effort trying to understand the disease uh, to ultimately treat these disease and identify these disease. So that's really where my passion lies. And that's really what Keen Health sort of fundamental vision and, and mission is, is to help people uh, improve their gut health. Great. Um, well, I, you know, you're speaking our, our language when you're talking about autoimmune diseases and conditions like celiac, because that is uh, much more common in people with Hashimoto's and thyroid issues and the entire issue of, of autoimmune health and immune health and where it's going in the future is something that is so pertinent to your company's mission. So we're very excited to hear more and learn more. Uh, we're going to pop over back to Dr. Nunez. Um, so Dr. Nunez, if you can set up a little bit of the understanding for us by explaining what the microbiome is and why it really matters for people who aren't necessarily as familiar with it or, we, or who know generally the idea of gut health is important. But if you can give us a little bit more of the specifics on that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. I will try to be like, try to simplify a very complex subject, but we can start with what actually microbiome means. Microbiome means small life, like the small microorganisms that live within and outside you. And the simplest definition that you can think about it is that the microbiome is every microorganism, all the microorganisms that including their genes and their function, meaning their, what is code in their DNA and what they are doing. And that live or dwell within a particular habitat. So if you think of a, a particular plant, you will think that all the bacteria that surround the plant and is within the, the roots of the plant. And in the soil, it will be the plant microbiome. Uh, as you might think, there's not only multiple microbiomes. I, there are multiple microbiomes within each part of the plant or each part of our cell. So you will find the microbiome of the dog, the microbiome of the plants, soil microbiome, you will find what we call built environment, which is the bacteria that you can find in the metro, in the subway, in, the, in a car, in your house, but also it's the human microbiome. And the human microbiome is composed of a smaller, let's say, groups of other micro microbiomes, like the gut microbiome, the respiratory microbiome, the genital microbiome. So as you see, microbiome basically is all the microbiome organisms and their function, and their genes that live in a specific habitat. Um, so in particular, the gut microbiome, it's important because it's number one, the most big in numbers in your body. Um, actually, the amount I can show you some slides that we have to make it our point more easy to understand. So basically, if you start counting the number of bacteria we have in our body, you will find out that we have 1.3 more microorganisms in our body than human cells. So that's uh, a lot of bacteria. And only uh, just gut, you will find that we have around four, 14, uh, sorry, uh, 10 to the 13 potency of bacteria just around your gut. Uh, a person usually holds that number of uh, cells within their body. So just in your gut, you will find the number of cells you have in your body. All the other ones, the, the skin microbiome, the nose microbiome, the vaginal microbiome, the genital microbiome, will add more to that number. And in terms of genes, they far surpass human genome. We uh, suspect we have around 23,000 genes in our body, but uh, if you can all the genes that you can find in the market, and you will find that I have a million genes. So there's the amount of, it, it's hard to grasp the amount of bacteria that we have. Um, so let me stop sharing here. So that is one of the, the things that 
the microorganisms. And the gut microbiome, as I said, is, is big and important, but it has many relationships with our health. Uh, one of the key examples that we find out that bacteria is really important for our health is experiments on animals. Um, there's this kind of breed of uh, mouses that laboratory uses that they don't have any bacteria in their gut. And they're especially created for that purposes. And when they see they're developing over the years, you will see that they uh, develop a lot of diseases, in, including in autoimmune diseases. So there's a clue there that there's somehow a relationship between the gut microbiome and or health. That's one of the first uh, clues we have, but there's not only that relationship that we have with uh, bacteria. There's also, uh, they help us with, let me show you another slide. Basically what, um, they also participate in the production of nutrients like vitamin K and B that not necessarily we can produce. They produce by bacteria and absorb in our large intestine. Uh, but just by being there, like in this really high number, they actually act as a physical barrier against other microorganisms. So if you get a, a, a bad bacteria in your gut, probably it's going to be keep at bay because they cannot enter the, this layer of bacteria that is around your, your gut. But also, as we have been mentioning, they can regulate the immune system. They produce certain substances that the immune system reacts to and can regulate it, uh, helping uh, with anti-inflammatory properties. And we can go into detail later on. And one of the key functions that they also can do is to provide energy to the gut lining cells. One of the different products of bacteria is actually fuel for our gut cells. So they give us energy to keep all things running. And of course, it's that all related with, with the health, but the disease, we have seen that there are many diseases related to the gut microbiome, including IBD, obesity, di diabetes, and every year or every passing day, we find out there's a new relationship with the microbiome and health. Uh, so that is kind of a, what we can say about the microbiome and what it's important for us. Thank you. That's an excellent overview. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, just from, from the reading that I've done on the microbiome, I mean, we're only touching on just a small number of the many things that it really has an impact on. I, you know, I've been doing some reading lately and seeing that there's a, a strong link between mental health and the microbiome and uh, obesity and the microbiome. There's so many different things that um, have a, uh, an impact on all of us uh, in terms of our general health and in particular our immune health. So um, let's go over to Take to find out a little bit more about the timeline for the microbiome. I and mean, when did we start really calling it this and discovering that this was its own entity in a sense? Because really we're viewing it almost like it's its own organ, although it's, it's not a discrete organ. And how has this evolved? I mean, from what Dr. Nunez was saying, it's like every day there's something new we're finding out about the microbiome. But can you give us a little sense of the timeline uh, on, on this? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's funny, right? Because it is, to your point, this new concept or relatively new verbiage that's been used in, in many different facets. But obviously the microbiome the gut microbiome, every microbiome that's part of our body has persisted, uh, been prevalent, uh, been present since, you know, the beginning. <laughs> this is a, you know, call it a symbiotic relationship where we cannot live without the microbiome, right? As we define it. That is to say, we've co-evolved. They can't live without us and we can't live without them. And if we were to, in theory, wipe out the microbiome, we would probably not live very long. I mean, I'm talking probably, you know, minutes. <laughs> so, so in that sense, yes, it's, it's always been around, but the concept of the microbiome, yes, is new. And, and right before this, uh, this, this discussion, I did just a quick little Google search, as we all do, as a, uh, as a matter of background, just to see, yeah, when, when did we start using the term microbiome? And it turns out, at least in terms of scientific, you know, peer-reviewed journals, the first time it appeared in a title of a, of a journal article was 2006 as far as far as I can find 
that's less than 20 years ago, as, as, as we know. That's pretty new when it comes to science, right? But, but of course, you know, we use microbiome relatively interchangeably with words like metagenomics and metagenomics is more of a perhaps a technical word that specifically addresses the genetic makeup of a microbial community within an environmental niche. So the gut microbiome being a, uh, the gut being an environmental niche. When we look at all the DNA and the genes that make up that community, uh, within a person, within a sample, you know, that, that's metagenomics. But basically by microbiome, we mean, the, again, the community of microbes, have it be bacteria, virus, or, or what have you, that make up that environment. Um, it, it's interesting that that is not a new concept outside of human health or disease, right? I, I, again, I think Harold touched on this. When we think about microbiology in general, that's been around for a long time. Think about like penicillin and so on. But what, what was microbiology before the microbiome? And this might be an overly simplified ver version of that, but it was generally the idea of what types of microorganisms, typically bacteria, could I grow in a petri dish and study under a microscope, right? And that's still in many ways sort of the foundation of microbiology. Um, but what's changed and what's evolved into the microbiome is the fact that in a complex microbial community, a lot of these organisms cannot thrive, cannot grow in a petri dish. Why? Because they don't like light. They don't like oxygen. They don't like many different things about the environment within, say, a laboratory that allows them to thrive. But think about the gut environment, low pH, highly acidic. Uh, depending on where we are in the GI system. Obviously, very little to no light, very little to no oxygen. That's where these organisms have evolved to thrive. So how do we study them if we can't study them in a Petri dish? Well, coming back to my original point about genomics and DNA technology, well, guess what? All these organisms, no matter what environment they thrive in, have DNA. So we can take a sample from a person Typically it's a fecal sample because it's obviously abundant and plentiful and easy to access. Uh, we can pull out all the, all the cells and DNA from those cells and study it in the lab at the DNA molecular level. So there's two advantages to that. Number one, it doesn't matter if they grow in a dish or not as long as you can access their DNA. And also by understanding them at the DNA or molecular level, you can actually study their function. What do they do? We, Harold mentioned the genes. What do these genes do? What do they metabolize? What pathways do they represent? So we can start to elucidate the, the, the function and the mechanism of a particular microbiome. So the science is needless to say, to your point uh, and everybody's point, still evolving. A lot of the science is still correlative or associative. You take a group with some disease, say a particular type of autoimmune disease, and you compare it to a group that doesn't have that disease, and you see differences. By differences, what do I mean? I mean diversity, right? Not so much necessarily the presence of bacteria A versus bacteria B and so on. You know, we're all humans after all. We share a lot of the same kinds of same types of bacteria, but we're seeing that the, the diversity in terms of their relative abundance to one another. So more of A versus B. And sometimes, oftentimes, also different bacteria just clearly seem to not be present in one group versus in the other. So there is a diversity question that is definitely kind of the growing hypothesis that's driving a lot of this. Just as a side note, you know, we were talking about uh, South America and, and different parts of the world. You know, there's been interesting studies that compared different isolated populations within the globe. So you think about the Amazon forest or different parts of uh, Africa. And we looked at their microbiome, not just the gut, but also skin microbiome, different. Generally speaking, the trend is that those isolated populations that typically live off the land and they, you know, that are not on sort of Western medicine type practices have a far more diverse microbiome than we did, or we do, I should say. Um, so is that to say that's the microbiome we intended to have? That is a, that's the original microbiome and everything we've done to ourselves since that time with our diet and medication and environment uh, has depleted that. A lot of people believe that, but diversity in the sense, and by the way, those, many of those populations, again, not to overgeneralize, do not suffer from 
the similar types of autoimmune diseases that we do. So again, correlate, you know, associative evidence there. It's correlation at this point. We don't know cause and effect. We don't know what's the chicken or the egg here, but, but it's some interesting findings that show that diversity, much like a diversity in a jungle or forest or an ecosystem matters, it does in the microbiome as well. And again, you know, the science is evolving, but we're finding some very interesting insights so far, and it continues on a daily basis. Okay. Um, so obviously this is, uh, you know, it's a complex subject, but I think that to, uh, to make it sort of simple in some ways for some of our viewers, uh, the, the, the basic understanding here is that we need to provide the right inputs into our microbiome as best as possible in order to create the best possible balance in that microbiome because that that gut health that healthy diversity that you're talking about is going to put us in a situation of better health so again back to back to you take um if we know that diet and nutrition affect our gut health but there, there are other factors as well, clearly, that are going to destabilize or imbalance or create uh, dysbiosis. It's going to create different types of bacterial overgrowth or shortages right. of the right kinds of bacteria. So besides what we eat and, uh, and, and the nutritional value of what we eat, what other things can really throw that microbiome out of balance and put us in a situation where, where we are at higher risk of other kinds of health issues? Right. So something that you mentioned before this, you know, what's commonly known as the gut brain access, right? And, and that's, that's typically more related to neurological disorders, have it be schizophrenia or autism or what have you, but also the idea, you know, in the, in the, in the very sort of Western lifestyle of go, 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 you know, stress, day-to-day day -day stress and lack of sleep, you know, all feeding into our neurological system, holistically speaking, uh, has a direct impact in what's happening in our gut. And as, as, as we all know, it's a feedback loop, right? All the external environmental inputs back into our gut, our, our gut then what's in our gut responds to us and vice versa. And it's this delicate balance that is clearly moving toward off in an off balance state. And so, you know, not to say what sounds so cliche now is, hey, eat more, you know, eat better foods and take, you know, take your supplements and sleep more, exercise more. Yeah, we, we all know that, but we're also seeing that that's no longer just what your, you know, primary care physician tells you because they have to. Uh, we know that it actually means something. And so you think about, again, stress or sleep, those are important. And we're seeing evidence as, a, as the gut microbiome becomes a potential readout of that. The people that don't, that have stress, that don't sleep well, have a lower diversity in the gut microbiome. Yeah. So that's one example. Another Actually, one, I think- Sorry to interrupt you. Just to give you an idea how this train of thought has been within humanity for so long. It's like uh, in the anti-Greece people, there's a quote from Hippocrates that say that all disease begin in the gut. So it's right. like 2000 years ago. So yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is amazing that people have been thinking about this for so long and only now we've seen some of the, you know, the science or the data to support it, which is all great. Uh, the other, you know, the, the kind of the other sort of sim simplistic view of this is, okay, what is our gut connected to? What's the input to our gut? Obviously the most obvious one is, well, yeah, it's through our mouth. It's what we put into our mouth. So we talked about food and supplements, that's the audience. But nowadays, what else do we put into our mouth, right? A lot of medication, a lot of different kinds of medicine over the counter prescribed or otherwise. And there's been some very interesting studies that show that certain, not even categories of medication or sometimes specific medications um, that are intended to of course treat symptoms or disease actually have an adverse effect uh, on our gut microbiome, uh, you know, a side effect, if you will. I mean, obviously the most obvious one um, is antibiotics. Its purpose is to kill bacteria and microorganisms. And oftentimes it is very necessary if you have a life-threatening infection uh, or, or what have you. So I would, I'm not a PhD, you know, I'm not an MD, but if, if a doctor prescribes a, a, an antibiotic to you, 
obviously that's something you should consider seriously and it's fair for you to question that and i'm not saying don't pick antibiotics nobody here is saying that but but think about again what 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 does it do right and there are other i only use that as a proxy to say there are many other uh, medications out there uh, that affect the microbiome the other way to think about that not to go off on a slight tangent here is are there parts of the microbiome that activate drugs so they, that they are more effective. And that's also been demonstrated. So again, not to diminish the role of medication in, in healthcare, obviously it plays a very pivotal role, but it does play a role in the gut microbiome. So these are things to consider as we think about gut health. Terrific, thank you. Um, Dr. Nunez, uh, one of the things uh, that our viewers are frequently interested in because of Paloma Health's focus on hypothyroidism is hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's autoimmune disease. Um, can you explain a bit more for us specifically how these um, microbes affect our immune health? What is that, how is that relationship working? Um, and how can a healthy gut support someone with an autoimmune disease in particular. So uh, Dr. Nunez, let's, let's go to you for that one. Yeah, sure. So we mentioned briefly that one of the key interactions within the gut microbiome and uh, our bodies is between the immune system and our cells. Uh, and that's why the gut itself uh, contains around 70% of lymphoid nodes that are in all our body. So there's a lot of input there to the gut microbiome to interact with the immune system. So that's why it's such an, an important part of our cell. Uh, you think of all the cells that are involved in the health, T cells, plasma cells, uh, the, the ones that make antibodies are located there. So it's a massive amount of the immune system interacting every day with the immune system. And I mentioned that the bacteria also protects our cells by acting as a barrier to bad microorganisms. But what actually is also happening is that the immune system needs to know between, okay, you are a foe or you're a friend. So what the bacteria helps to do is actually that. The immune system start to learn from the very beginning from when you are born, that some bacteria is good for yourself and some other no. So it, the interaction between bacteria and the immune system start there. Actually, it has been shown that when you were born by vaginal, uh, the, the natural way, uh, you are more chances to be healthy than people who is born by cesarean section because uh, those people don't get the imprint from their mother with the microbiome. So the development of the gut is a little bit slower. Can, can there's the, the, the hypothesis there. Is there, given that you don't have this specific bacteria from your mother, your gut is going to develop a little bit differently. That's because when babies breastfeed, they, they get the milk from the mother and the milk from the mother contains certain carbohydrates that bacteria can use and produce certain substances that help the gut to close the gap between the cells. So newborns have uh, no fully developed gut and their cells are a little bit like not close enough between them, tight junctions, we call them. So what bacteria does is produce certain substances that can help to close those gaps. But if you don't have them because you were born by cesarean section, probably you will have more of uh, inflammatory processes going on and that can trigger exacerbated responses from the immune system. So that's the way one relationship goes between gut bacteria and the immune system. But of course, bacteria also can help to reduce inflammation. One of the ways that bacteria does that is to see it produce certain substances after feeding from what we eat that can have uh, anti-inflammatory effects on our gut cells. So there's many points of interaction there. And specifically about the uh, immune diseases that we are focusing here on, on our tag, uh, researchers have found differences between people with Hashimoto or epidermidism against healthy people. As Taki mentioned before, we just compare. We take samples from people who is healthy, samples from people who has this disease and compare them. And one of the key findings is that we have uh, people with healthy microbiome, oh, sorry, that are healthy with higher diversity. 
It might be for many reasons because probably people is taking medication, so that affects the microbiome. So it's complex to know because kind of a chicken of an egg situation uh, because we have a very close relationship with, mm -hmm. with the gut. So it's kind of hard to know, but we have clues that it's something happening. And certain groups of bacteria are really different in, in, in both groups. But also there's many factors that are related to having hypothyroidism or Hashimoto disease that are also affecting the gut microbiome. I can show you, we also prepare some very specific or simple slide to show you that um, the microbiome can be affected by sex hormones, uh, by obesity, by where you live, the type of diet you have, the gender you have, the age you have. And those uh, factors are also share with the autoimmune diseases. Uh, some uh, gender have more um, prevalence of these diseases. And let's say iodine, if you take not enough iodine, you would have hypothyroidism. And the amount of iodine that you can get from your diet can affect the micro. So there's a two-way relationship there can, can, can be important uh, for the autoimmune diseases. But basically, what I'm trying to say is that the immune system reacts to the gut microbiome, and the gut microbiome can help the immune system to respond to uh, external challenges. And those external challenges can be exacerbated because the uh, gut microbiome can increase the response of the immune system because it's telling this is an inflammation process and exacerbates that, and the immune system starts to overreact. It. There's actually what we call mimicry between antibodies against the thyroid that can be found on certain people with high level of certain bacteria. And certain bacteria have been found to share those antibodies. Some species of uh, and genuses of bacteria uh, in, in animal models, not human necessarily, so we need to be clear on that, uh, have been found to be shared uh, antibodies against certain bacteria and the thyroid. So that's one theory that can help explain why uh, these uh, responses of the immune system uh, trigger the hypothyroidism. Uh, we need, of course, more research to be clear on that, uh, but this is the kind of information we have right now. Well, this is absolutely fascinating. And um, I'm hoping that our viewers today live and people who are going to be watching this on replay are getting the message that the gut microbiome is essential part of almost every aspect of our health and in particular has some serious relevance for those of us with autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's disease, and hypothyroidism. So I guess the next question and um, I'm going to uh, ask you to, uh, to take this one, Take. How do we find out what's going on? I mean, we know that, you know, those of us with Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism and or other types of chronic diseases, we know that we have some sort of health condition. So we can assume everything's not perfect, but how do we actually figure out what is going on in the microbiome? Are there ways to test it? And, you know, what are, what are we looking for with, the, with that process? Right. Yeah, so the short answer is, is yes, we, we need to test, right? Uh, it's it's one thing to which is very important to collect all the the call it the uh, the patient information in terms of uh, the symptoms the different types of measurements you might take at, at at your doctor's office or a clinic or what have you but obviously in the context of this conversation what's not being measured on a patient by patient basis is the microbiome. And based on everything we've said so far, it might sound a little bit far out there or science fiction-ish, but the reality is it's not. You know, uh, one thing I touched on earlier is that this type of technology is actually quite accessible even today. And that's precisely what we're doing at Keen Health is it's about access. I think in light of COVID, we learned that we obviously still need healthcare uh, even though we might be isolated at home and, and so on. And even the idea of COVID testing, you know, when you want to test yourself to see what health state you're in or what disease state you're in, do I have something? Do I not have something? I think we all learn across America that it's actually quite uh, ubiquitous and, and accessible, even from home. You can take these kinds of tests from home. 
And, and it's the same with the gut microbiome. The idea that you can self-collect the sample, send it to a laboratory, and get a report on exactly what's happening inside your body at a genetic level, molecular level, however you want to define it, specific to you, very unique to you and that, from that time point, and do that repeatedly as you need to or want to based on different diet changes, medication changes, lifestyle changes, because that is the beauty, if you will. The wonder of the microbiome is unlike our own DNA, we can change it. It is changeable. Our microbiome probably changed this morning based on what we ate for breakfast. <laughs> so the idea to have that become sort of a mindset, if you will, of, as we like to say, you know, stop guessing, start testing, right? It, it is a reality today. You know, we'll, we'll take care of the, of the hard technical part and we'll, we'll give you insights that are actionable so that you can make these kinds of important lifestyle decisions about what's working for you, what's not working for you. It's never, you know, none of these tests, microbiome or otherwise, uh, even including COVID, for example, because everybody's very familiar with that right now, you don't just act on the test result itself. You act on how you're feeling. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a conjunction or sort of a merger of all these different inputs and data where we allow ourselves to, to make the best decision. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna claim that anything is a silver bullet here, obviously. The point here is to make this accessible so that everybody can make better decisions about their health and wellness. Okay, and how complicated is this test to perform? I mean, can you just walk me through the, the typical steps? Sure. What, what are we sampling? Is it a, a fecal sample? It, it is in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, our particular protocol is to basically take a, uh, a sterile swab that we provide as part of our sample collection kit. And, uh, you know, after duty calls, we take a little swipe off a of used toilet paper, put that in the tube, send it back to our lab in our, you know, uh, a pre-mail package and, pre uh, uh, and that's it. That's, that's all, really, that's all you need yeah. to, to be able to I might have this. already overcomplicated it, but that's <laughs> essentially what it is. And what does it, what does a report look like? I mean, is it something that the average person's going to be able to do something with, or is it going to have, you know, here's the 92 different bacteria you have and here, you know, or is it going to say, you got too much of this, you need to do that. Uh, you know, how, how does it work for, for people who aren't sure. scientists like you and Dr. Oh, Nunez? Great, great, great question. Because well, to your point, this is intended for the shall we say, the everyday American, which of course, many of us are not scientists or trained in microbiology or otherwise. Right. So understanding that that is our, our primary user, uh, we need to make it understandable uh, and interpretable and, but most importantly, actionable, right? We don't want to provide something that people cannot act on. But oftentimes when we think about somebody acting on something, they might want to consult with a different stakeholder, have it be their physician or, uh, uh, or even a friend or, or some, you know, a spouse or what have you, a family member uh, that might know a little more about health and wellness beyond what they do. The idea there is the shareability of it is important as well, because we understand a lot of these kinds of lifestyle decisions are not made in isolation. So in that sense, our model, if you will, that we're working toward, it's a work in progress, I, I have to admit, is that we need to provide layers of information. So the first layer, of course, is the most basic, whoever is the, whoever is the user, whoever that sample belongs to, we have to keep them first and foremost in mind in terms of the usability of that information. So, you know, what can I do about my diet? What can I do about my lifestyle? How, how, how is my microbiome similar to other people with similar conditions or not? That type of basic information. But occasionally, depending on what those, you know, was I high, medium, or low? I'm just using that as an as a example. You might want to dig a little deeper. Well, geez, I'm high in something. What does that mean? So to be able to click on that and say, oh, this is what it means to be high. And then maybe you want to dig even one more level deeper and say, okay, well, high in this and or high in that, what does that mean? Specifically, what bacteria are we talking about? Right. If you want to get into that level of detail, especially with somebody that knows more about that, then 
we could we'll we'll get so we want to be very transparent about how mm -hmm. we came to our conclusions sure. but we want to present that in a layered way so that depending on where we are in the stakeholders uh kind of journey that we can dig as deep as you want mm -hmm. but we understand that ultimately the main primary user here is again the regular american consumer terrific terrific um I want to go over to Dr. Nunez uh, with a question. And um, we have uh, a lot of old wives tales and conventional wisdom and moms and grandmas and people giving us a lot of advice about a lot of different things. And, you know, I happen to always think about my uh, grandfather who is uh, no longer with us, but came from the old country back in the Middle East. And anytime anybody got sick, no matter what you had, he would tell you, you, you know, you have to eat yogurt, 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 yogurt. And everybody thought, oh, it's just, you know, old guy from the Middle East advice. And now we know to a large extent that because the immune system is so um, involved with our gut health, that probiotics that are in yogurt may in fact help strengthen the immune system against almost anything that's going on. So there was some science behind the old wives tales and the, and the grandpa's advice. But um, what do we need to know from a scientific standpoint now about the things that we can do to improve and maintain our gut health? Um, do you recommend it be through diet or just uh, supplements or both? And should we, should everybody be taking probiotics and do we need prebiotics and, you know, how do mm -hmm. we know the difference? So if you can kind of walk us through that, uh, Dr. Nunez, uh, how some practical actionable things that us average people can do to help improve our gut health and maintain our gut health. Uh, once we have a, you know, we've tested, we know maybe there's some imbalances, there's things out of, out of whack, or we haven't even tested yet, but we want to focus on it. What do we do next? Sure. Uh, first thing is that your, your grandpa was right. <laughs> <laughs> it's surely he was right. Basically, it's, it's, will come down, of course, of your own personal options. Uh, you have some room to move uh, and take some options that might help you to get a better, let's say, gut microbiome or, or support them uh, in a way that can uh, also support you and your health. Uh, the most basic one is to just introduce fiber to your diet. If you are the one that uh, likes to eat whole wheat uh, or other kind of fibers that you can uh, get access to it, it it's the best and simple way to do it or western diet is high on proteins and, and 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 fat so that's not necessarily something good for the gut microbiome so basically uh, the recommendation is try to eat healthy that's the most basic one and if you can uh, let's say uh, introduce uh, fiber to that that will do a lot for you, including vegetables, nuts, uh, brown rice, beans, whatever you, you might like, okay, you have options. And we provide some of them as examples and try to adjust based on, on your own type of issues. So some people just cannot eat gluten. So we have some options that people can, can look and, and see what they can do for them. Okay. Um, consuming products that were created by fer uh, fermentation, like yogurt. Yogurt contains live bacteria, especially if it's homemade. Usually if you buy from the counter in the, in the supermarket, you will not have that kind of, of uh, advantage. But if you try to make your own yogurt at home, it will be good to have. Uh, it can be either from bacteria or, or fungus, uh, or yeast. So those uh, two ways to produce yogurt. And if you like to do sports, that's a very good way to increase the diversity in your gut. People who do sport has been to ha have seen to have a higher diversity in their gut. And even 30 minutes a day of a brief walk can help you to achieve that. So for, for one, you have diet, like trying to eat healthy, introducing grains and, and fever, doing exercise, but also you mentioned supplements. So people can avoid all the other stuff and try supplements. And there's many kinds of supplements. And you mentioned probiotics and probiotics, and we can try to explain that what it is, each of those. Basically, probiotics are live microorganisms uh, that are in the food you eat. And you can take them either as a powder or capsules that are directly 
prepared beforehand or introducing, like we may just mentioned, like you eating fermented products like yogurt or whatever you might have. Um, but if you eat uh, supplements, uh, probiotics, uh, try to look for the ones that have at least 10 billions CFU. Uh, that's a number that you usually find on the probiotics label. If, you, if they have less than that, probably you will not see uh, any uh, results around that or benefits associated with that. So try mm -hmm. to go higher than that. And the other thing is to try to avoid anything that will do harm uh, within the advice that already Taki give. Um, so if you are going to take antibiotics, a good thing might be like try to, after the treatment, take some probiotics to support and get to where you were before, mm -hmm. faster than before. Do not not take antibiotics. I mean, the doctor is prescribing you for a reason and actually follow to the letter. You see, he said like, you have to take it for seven days, taking seven days and not five because you are feeling better. You have to take it in seven days. So that's uh, the general advice. And in terms of prebiotics, which are substances that are the food for probiotics, basically in a nutshell, uh, prebiotics are the food for bacteria. They have the capacity to uh, help bacteria thrive. So when you add that as a part of your diet, a certain bacteria will benefit from it and grow more than others. And happens to be that those bacteria are beneficial for you. Um, you can find supplements of prebiotics like inulin uh, easily available, but also you can eat it within your diet. Some uh, produce uh, can have higher amounts of those. Uh, examples are artichokes, are really high on, on, on prebiotics, uh, potatoes after being cooked and cold. Uh, if, you are, if you eat them, you will have high amount of inulin on them, onion, asparagus, banana. So you have plenty of options that you can uh, pursue, uh, but that is just very general and, and can be more specific based on what you are looking for. Right. Um, so essentially what, we're, what I'm hearing is that we need to feed the bacteria the forms of food that they respond to. So that's the higher fiber, uh, vegetables, carbohydrates, uh, foods that are rich in inulin, and we are feeding them so that they are a, the good bacteria is able to do its job and help to maintain some balance. That fermented foods uh, like yogurt and other types of, of fermented foods are also going to help by, re by introducing new um, bacteria into the microbiome. So, um, I mean, these are, these are, this is all good advice. Um, one more question for you on uh, related to this, uh, uh, Dr. Nunez. We're talking about testing our gut health, testing our microbiome. How does this differ from food sensitivity testing? Because, you know, I, I turn on the television these days and there's somebody selling you a kit to, you know, find out if you're sensitive to food, find out what you're, uh, what's bothering your stomach, find out this or that. And I don't know that everybody necessarily understands the difference between testing to see if you're allergic to gluten or allergic to certain foods or sensitive mm -hmm. to certain foods and testing to see what's going on with the microbiome. Can you explain a little bit of the difference there? Yeah, yeah. So basically when you're testing for food sensitivity is that some specific component of within your diet is causing some allergies or reaction from your immune system, like gluten. So um, there's different degrees of allergy to the gluten, some more severe to others. So people just feel kind of sick or they cannot tolerate like eating bread and they really feel bad after eating or some people like, it's like a really severe reaction to it. So with this test, you can know which kind of components in your diet can cause this allergy reaction. The gut microbiome is kind of different. It's that testing for what it is inside you that can help you in some ways uh, to reduce inflammation, uh, trying to support your, your fight against obesity, let's say, or uh, have an, a better sleep because this relationship between the brain and the gut have been shown that there's a connection between them. So it's kind of different. One is like testing for allergies and reactions to your food. And the other is to, to know what is inside and how you can support it to many different effects. Um, I don't know if it's clear on that, but- Yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, that, that, that covered it. Um, uh, 
we're going to be wrapping up shortly. I did want to mention to folks that um, the folks at Keen Health are giving us a special bonus for people that are watching um, the program today. There's a 40% off the Keen Gut uh, Plus kit with the code Paloma40. And um, it's the link is Keen Health, K E A N health.com slash gut health. So uh, we invite you to check that out and learn a little bit more about the specialized testing that they're doing and to take uh, advantage of this generous discount that we're being offered. Um, Take, I was wondering if you had any additional thoughts on what uh, we all should be doing to take good care of our microbiome and uh, feed it good things and do good things for it. Yeah, I just have one thought to add that's a relatively new, but definitely uh, increasing popularity concept. So we talked about prebiotics and probiotics, but there's actually a third component to this, if I can call it a component, it's postbiotics. So the idea there with, let's use yogurt as an example, the bacteria that grow in yogurt lactobacillus and all the different things you see when you buy a, 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 a thing of yogurt are there because they of course thrive in milk products. Our gut is not made of milk. As we talked about earlier, it's a very different kind of environment than what you might find in a fermenter of yogurt, right? Light, the pH, the, uh, the oxygen level, so on. So if you actually study and measure the microbiome of the gut, those organisms are, are not necessarily very prevalent. So then why does yogurt help anyway? Well, the working hypothesis is that, of course, it's not really the presence of these bacteria in your gut, but it's something that they're doing or something that they're making. They are living cells after all, all these bacteria are. So they're taking stuff that we put into our body and they're putting stuff out there. All sorts of compounds and chemicals, some which we've yet to even understand or identify. We already talked about how many genes that these, uh, or the, the complex community has. They're, they're making a lot of stuff and we're still trying to understand that. But let's call that the business end of the microbiome, right? So again, these, Bacteria that are made in yogurt might pass through us because they don't, they're not necessarily happy in that environment, but they're putting stuff out there that we need and like. It makes our body happy. It makes our gut happy. So that's great. But imagine all the other bacteria that are missing because you have an autoimmune disease or whatnot. Some of those bacteria you can't necessarily grow and put in a pill for the various reasons I mentioned. But what about the stuff that they make, the, the bioactives? or as I said, maybe it's, we would call it the postbiotics. If we could put those things that are made by bacteria in a pill and give that to people, that is actually circumventing the whole process of prebiotics and probiotics and just going straight to the, again, the business end of what the microbiome does that is beneficial to us. And it can be very targeted and specific. So that is sort of the, call it the future or even the holy grail of, of microbiome sciences. Let's just give people what the chemical that they need that is made by the microbiome rather than trying to replace the microbiome or supplement or feed. It's one working you know, uh, hypothesis here. And there are many groups in, uh, in, in major universities and companies that are working on that. And it's an exciting space to keep an eye out on. It sounds like a new frontier, but in the meantime, we can have fun eating our yogurt and our pickles and our kombucha right. and... <laughs> Uh, going for our, our uh, exercise, like Dr. Nunez recommended. Absolutely. Um, I want to thank both of you, uh, Dr. Harold Nunez, Take Ogawa from Keen Health, for giving us sort of a mini masterclass in everything we need to know about the microbiome. And I feel like we could have probably spent uh, hours talking about this and learning more about it. I personally am just fascinated by the topic. And so we, again, we hope people take advantage of uh, the opportunity to get the kit. Um, and, but I want to thank you both. And I'm going to turn it over to Katie to wrap us up uh, for today's session. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And thank you, Dr. Nunez and Take. This was very informative and it's exciting to sort of hear about, you know, what's coming next in 
uh, microbiome research. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I hope that you are walking away with uh, more information about why and how to keep your microbiome healthy. And we will make sure to send out the replay within the next 24 to 48 hours. We will make sure to include um, the contact information for Keen Health so you can get more information from them if you need it. And we'll include um, their discount code and a gift from us. So thank you everyone for your time and we will see you next month at our next speaker series. Thanks everyone. Thank Goodbye. Thank you.